All right, guys, we are um, outside of the light board room for a lecture finally, right? You're kind of tired of that pitch black room all the time. So we are talking about vocals. This is the actual first time that we're going to talk about doing something that you would think of in a recording studio. Now, what I've got set up here is a very, very typical, other than the fact that there's three mics up here, um, kind of ignore three, just pretend there's one for right now. This is a very typical vocal setup. Let me explain what's so standard about it. For one thing, usually you're going to have um, a condenser mic for most vocals, unless you're doing something like rap or hard rock where you've got somebody who wants to have a very strong, shouty, punchy sound. But if you're doing more singer-songwriter stuff or um, pop, usually you're talking about a condenser mic of some kind. So you'll have a condenser mic set up and you'll have a pop filter usually, uh, especially if it's a condenser, not so often if it's a dynamic. But the other thing is the pop filter will usually be in an, a slightly different angle than the microphone. So the mic may be like this and you can see the pop filter is angled forward right here like that. So the mics are straight up and down, the pop filters kind of forward. And this just kind of helps us uh, keep any plosives from being directed right into the mic. The pop filter keeps my p -p plosive P's from overdriving the diaphragms of the microphone. Uh, also, you'll see that there's a certain amount of distance involved. There's probably at least one hand width between the mics and the pop filter. And when I'm singing, I'm probably going to be about one hand width away from the pop filter, which puts me close to 12 inches away from the microphone. This is not a hard and fast rule. Some people get a little bit closer. Some people maybe even get a little further away. But the idea is if you're too close to the microphone, then you lose a little bit of the whole picture of your voice. Um, if, a, if a microphone gets just right up on the mouth, you're still going to hear your voice and it's going to sound like you, but it's not going to sound quite as natural. The more you move back, the less proximity effect, the less bass you get in your, in your voice, and also just the less intense it sounds. And while there are some songs that would require a very intense in-your-face vocal and you might want to be right up against the pop filter, there are others for which your voice will sit in the mix better if you're further back. So you got to know kind of uh, what type of song you're doing and just experiment a little bit. Um, a good general place to start is two hand widths away with the pop filter in between your two hands. So this right here is very common. Anybody who uh, has been in the studio before would, would not be surprised at all if they came to record with you and you set up a, a vocal in such a way. Now what I've done is I've set up three different types of microphones for us to listen to. I have a condenser tube mic, the uh, Sputnik from M-Audio. It's about uh, six or $700. I've got the Shure SM7B, which is a dynamic mic. It's probably about 300 bucks. Then I've got the Audio-Technica AT2020, which is the dirt cheap $99 condenser mic. But you'd be surprised how it, it can hold its own you know, $99 versus seven or $800. And then, so we've got three great price ranges here, 99 bucks, 300 bucks, 700 bucks. Uh, I'm gonna sing just a little bit. We're gonna be able to listen to each one and it'll be the same take. So uh, we should be able to tell very clearly which mic has what type of character. Now, I am in a small room here. And so this room is a little bit more live than I would like it to be. And it's definitely smaller than I'd like it to be. Um, but we can still make this work and we'll have to pay attention as we're listening very carefully to how much room sound we're getting in um, into the mic and I might be able to get a little bit closer to the mics to reduce the room sound if I don't like what I'm hearing and I'm gonna sing um, a phrase and uh, we'll try the phrase at a couple different distances this is right up against the pop filter so only about six inches away the fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light. Forty many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. The fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light. Forty many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. 
The fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light. Forty many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. I'm gonna scoot back a little bit. I bumped with the stand. I hope it didn't pick up in the mic too much. Now we're at a hand away from the pop filter, so this is quite a bit further. The fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light for a many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. The fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light for a many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. The fox ran out on a chilly night. He prayed for the moon to give him light for a many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh, town. Oh, town. Oh, many a mile to go that night before he reached the town. Oh. Now, one thing that I can point out is that、uh, the two lower-priced microphones, the Audio Technica condenser mic at ninety-nine bucks, and、uh, the Shure. They do not have different patterns. I can't switch to an omnidirectional pattern、uh, or a figure eight. They are both cardioid directional patterns. In fact, the Audio Technica doesn't have any controls on it at all. The Shure does have some bass roll-off controls, so I can actually play with how much bass the Shure is picking up, and I can decrease the bass if I want to.、Um, the more expensive microphone. The M Audio Sputnik, the Tube mic, it has all of the above. I can switch a, a little bit of bass out of it. I can switch to different patterns, and those things are going to change the sound a little bit. It'll change how much ambience is getting picked up.、Uh, but it's really important to be able to control the bass going in on a recording like this, especially for vocals. Most of the time, vocals have a lot of low, low, low energy stuff down around 40, 50 hertz. That absolutely is not going to do you any favors. It's not going to be heard by the time you try to mix your voice in with other instruments, and you can actually save yourself、uh, some trouble by getting it out. Now I haven't done that.、Um, I've left everything totally flat,、um, and I can do that in the mix process if I want to. But if you know what you're doing, a lot of folks will go ahead and do it here, so they don't have to worry about thinking、uh, about these things later on. Just some things to be aware of when you're、uh, recording vocals that there are controls on some of these microphones that will let you play with the pattern, play with the bass roll off, and even just listen for differences in tonal quality between the patterns. If you have time to play with those things, it's a good idea to do it.、Uh, if you're pressed for time, then a lot of times we just kind of do the basic setup, which is what you see here, and we roll.、Um, most of the time, you're going to be able to work with whatever you get. But it's great if you do have the time to experiment with which microphone is going to flatter the voice the best or the style,、uh, and even play with patterns and bass roll-off. One other thing I'd like to mention is that、uh, while you can plug most standard condensers and、uh, standard dynamics right in and start recording, a tube microphone will not sound its best right away. In fact, it'll sound pretty terrible right away. The tube usually needs to warm up for a few minutes. Uh, some people will even claim that the best sound、uh, from a tube mic is after 15-20 minutes of warming up. Now, what does warming up mean? Well, a tube mic is、uh, a lot trickier. For one thing, it has a XLR cable that is more than three pins. A lot of times, they are seven pins. And so that strange custom seven-pin XLR will go from the tube mic into a power supply, and a power supply like the M Audio、uh, will then be switched on. It'll plug right into the wall. You'll switch it on. You'll see the、um, the light start glowing, and that's when you know you're warming up the tube mic. Much like our other systems, you want to make all your connections with the power off. A、uh, tube can very easily have its、um, fuse blown if you plug it directly in while the power supply is turned on. So, this is that that idea coming back again. Make your connections before you power anything on. Plug your、uh, your specialized multi seven pin XLR cable into your tube mic, then into your power supply, 
uh, and then plug your power supply into the wall. Once those connections are made, then you can turn it on. Um, and you're going to want to wait. It will sound really rough for a while. But I think that usually with these particular mics from M-Audio, about 10 minutes is a good amount of time to let them warm up. And they usually start to sound a lot richer and fuller. If they are cold, they will sound really bright and harsh and pretty ugly until that tube warms up. So something to think about with tube microphones. Uh, there are other tube microphone designs that actually even require the microphone to be mounted upside down. Um, the M-Audio is not one of them, but uh, that's just the way that the heat radiates and it needs to be upside down to keep it from overheating. Uh, so do your research anytime you're using a tube mic. Make sure um, that it's being set up the way the manufacturer recommends. They're much more sensitive and much trickier than your standard condensers and dynamic mics. Okay, now one thing that we need to mention is especially in small rooms you can have something that doesn't really stand out as necessarily a bad ambience, but it's just muddy. The voice is not clean, it's not as, as precise as it needs to be. And so something that lots of folks use to a very high degree of success is some type of baffling or sound dampening behind themselves when they're doing vocals. What I have here is just a mic stand holding up a big packing blanket. And I can literally step into this area here and now the microphones are shooting into a very soft cushy area behind me. Uh, so whatever echoes might be building up in this small room behind me are going to be tapped down a little bit by uh, my sound cave, my soft packing blanket cave that is kind of uh, encapsulating me as I step back into it. You can also do this type of stuff uh, in other places if you want to, but usually the biggest bang for your buck comes from right behind your position uh, as you are looking at the microphones. I could set up another one behind the mics if I wanted to, or maybe I could set up a few more on the sides. Um, the main idea is just to not um, not necessarily get really, really close, because you can see this is at least five feet away from the microphones, but it's close to me. It's right up behind me as I'm recording my vocals. If I had my perfect situation, I would be in a big room that is also very dead. Not a gymnasium, certainly not a recital hall. Those places are echoey and live big rooms. But I mean more like a theater or a, um, a sound stage, a place that has lots of space, a tall ceilings and, and, and lots of room between uh, walls, but yet it doesn't have a lot of reverb. If I go to a place like that, um, I'm going to have a cleaner sound without necessarily all this stuff. But sometimes it's best to do both uh, if you can. Get the big room and the extra stuff behind you while you're recording. I think you might hear a difference. We'll, we'll try this with the, uh, with the sound cave up, and then we'll take it down. You can see what you think. OK. I'm going to go on just the Audio Technica, the cheap mic here. Take your cautionary tales, take your incremental gains, and all your sycophantic games, and throw them all away. All right, let's get rid of the sound cave. Take your cautionary tales, and take your incremental games, and all your sycophantic games, and throw them all away. Did you hear a difference? One thing that you can do if you are stuck in a kind of a boxy sounding room, aside from putting up your sound cave and even more and more stuff around you to kind of deaden things, you can also probably plan on using some EQ in the mix to pull some of the lower end down. A lot of times 200 hertz can be pulled out of the voice just a little bit. Maybe that's a little bit higher or lower depending on your specific room. It might be as high as 500 hertz. It might be 300 hertz. It might even be 100 hertz. Um, but sometimes just a two decibel or three decibel reduction in those areas can be enough to help the room not suck so much. Obviously, uh, these types of things shouldn't be as much of an issue 
in a nice big recording space like a soundstage or a live studio room.